I'm going to take the liberty first of assuming that everybody in the room knows who SQA is, that we're amongst family and friends. If anybody doesn't know, if you want to hold up your paddle now, I'll take a photograph and we'll arrange for a one-to-one -one audience later on. But seriously, I'm assuming that everybody knows what SQA does uh, and who we are. One quick plug, if you haven't already put your business card in the pot on our stand, please do that. You could win this evening at this evening's dinner uh, a Samsung Galaxy. So if you don't mind just waiting until we finish, but immediately we've finished, you can dash out and put your business card in the pot. Okay, over the next few minutes, I'm going to explain how SQA is responding to the challenge of the changing environment Raymond has outlined so evocatively, what we found out today and what we plan to do next. And to echo Raymond's point, how we're looking for partners to help us define and develop the future. To do this, I'm going to zoom out first to set the changes Raymond has referred to in a wider context, and then zoom in to consider their potential implications for education, training, and for assessment, which is at the heart of what SQA does. To zoom out first, earlier this year, as part of SQA's business change program, I was set a hard question to answer. The question is the one you can see on the slide behind me. What are the most appropriate ways and contexts for learners to demonstrate their competence in a way that provides SQA with the information it needs to certificate their ability. You may think that doesn't seem like a very hard question. After all, surely that's what SQA does. The hard part came with the why, why we were asking this question. And as Peter reminded us this morning, often the why question is the most difficult and the most powerful. And the why question was because this is what we wanted to do to develop a vision of the ways in which, over the medium to long term, SQA will develop and make use of new and innovative approaches to assessment. So this isn't about how we tweak assessment for HNs or how we address the challenge of National 4. It's about how we think fundamentally different about assessment, what we assess and how we assess in future. So I started by Googling the question because that's the answer to, er to everything now, isn't it? Google tells us everything we need to know. But on this front, unfortunately not. Whilst there were some insights, there is no consensus view of the future of assessment over the medium to long term. Reflecting on the question again, it became clear that we need to answer it effectively. We need to focus on another why. Why would we be assessing people in future? Just because we do it now, why would we continue to assess people in future? Because in any context, being clear about the purpose of an assessment, both at a system level and an individual level, is essential to getting that assessment right. So we set out to try to establish why SQA will be assessing, for what purpose we'll be assessing learners in future. A key and reassuring finding is that bigger and better minds than ours are already trying to understand the changes going on all around us and their implications. In early 2016, the World Economic Forum, the group of world leaders that gathers in Switzerland every year, published a report on what they termed the fourth industrial revolution. This report noted that we stand on the brink of a technological revolution that will fundamentally alter the way we live, work, and relate to one another. In its scale, scope, and complexity, the transformation will be unlike anything humankind has experienced before. It's characterized by a fusion of technologies that is blurring the lines between the physical, digital, and biological spheres. Pretty stirring stuff. And whether you find that exciting or a bit scary probably depends on your perspective. The World Economic Forum went on to note that new technologies are giving existing industries new ways of meeting customer needs. They're also allowing entirely new companies to challenge incumbents on the quality, price, or speed at which value is delivered. It used the term disruption to describe this activity. And I'm sure it's not hard for any of us to think of examples that we experience in our daily lives. Turning to the impact of the fourth industrial revolution on the world of work, this report, also by the World Economic Forum, had a number of observations. It notes that its impact across industries, geographies, and job roles is unclear. It talks about the, the fact that new jobs will be created in new industries at an increasing rate. It quotes one estimate that states by 2030, 60% of all primary age children will have jobs that don't currently exist in industries that don't currently exist. It talks about the fact that new and updated skills will be needing, needed for existing roles at an ever-increasing rate. It highlights the importance of so-called 21st century skills. I'll return to this point later. It points to increasing flexibility in employment. 
or to uncertainty and precarity, depending on your perspective, and to full-time employment potentially no longer being the norm to the gig economy writ large. And finally, it highlights the critical importance of talent, suggesting that talent will replace capital as the most important factor of production, and to new ways of identifying talent, the use of social media, digital badges, and other sources that Raymond referred to earlier.